In today's lecture, we're going to discuss muscles. There's four parts to today's lecture. In the first part, we want to discuss the different types of muscles. Cardiac, smooth, and skeletal. If we make an analogy, if we're talking about moving into an apartment, the types of muscles would be like if you were going to give someone a tour of the rooms in your apartment. The second thing we're going to talk about here is muscular structure. Here we're going to talk about everything from the muscle down to something called the sarcomere. And again, if we go to our analogy of describing how you move into an apartment, this would be uh, as if, you know, once we gave the tours of the room, we'd say, well, what's in each room exactly? The third thing is muscular uh, contraction. We're going to talk about things that are uh, called the neuromuscular junctions, as well as uh, things called sarcomeres. We'll talk about those further. And again, if we continue our analogy, this would be as if we're discussing, you know, within a given room, let's say the kitchen, how do the appliances work? The fourth thing we're going to talk about are skeletal mus muscular issues that could occur, uh, things like rigor mortis, uh, and things of that nature. And this again would be saying, well, you know, what problems could occur in our apartment with the appliances, if you like that analogy. So these are the four things we're going to talk about in today's lecture. But let's go ahead and get started on the first one here, the types of muscle. This is the learning objective associated with this portion of the lecture. So when you finish uh, this lecture, these are the things you want to be able to do. Okay, so let's tour the rooms. So the first question we want to ask ourselves uh, is what are the properties and functions of muscular tissue in general? So if we look at the properties, there are a few properties we want to keep in mind. The first is that muscles can contract, right? So it's sort of an obvious thing, but we want to make sure we note it. Muscles can contract. Second thing is that uh, this contraction can be excitable. In other words, you don't want your muscles contracting whenever they want to, right? There has to be some type of electrical impulse that signals them to contract. Uh, and muscles have this property. This is something um, that involves a neuromuscular junction that we'll talk about later in this lecture. Okay, the next is that muscles have to have the ability to extend. Right? They have to be able to extend. And then finally, they have to have some elasticity to them. Right? They have to have some elasticity. Okay, so what are the functions of muscles? Well, one, they produce movement. Two, they open and close passageways, uh, such as sphincters. They help uh, maintain posture and stabilize jo joints. Uh, and this is something that occurs with something called muscle tone. In other words, stabilizing posture and stabilizing joints uh, has to do with muscle tone in the sense of, uh, think of you, um, let's say your muscles are just relaxing, so you're not flexing. The tension that your muscles are experiencing as they relax, right, so that background level of uh, tension, that's called uh, muscle tone. And that's what's involved in posture and stabilization. And then fourth, muscles can generate heat. And they can generate a lot of heat. And this is seen by the fact that when you get too hot, your body, your body um, sweats to, uh, to help you, you know, cool off. Okay, so those are the properties and functions of muscles uh, that we want to uh, you know, note. Okay, so what are the three main types of muscles? Well, there's cardiac muscle, there's smooth muscle, there's skeletal muscle. Uh, cardiac muscle, an example would be, and the only example in humans is the heart, the muscle that forms the heart. Uh, smooth muscle is muscles that you could see in blood vessels in the digestive uh, tract. And then uh, the, the third type of muscle, skeletal muscle, is seen with, you know, muscles like your biceps, your triceps, uh, gastro gastrocnemius, those type of muscles. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, look at each of these in a little more depth. So we're going to move them to the side here. Okay, let's talk about these. So again, cardiac, smooth, and skeletal. Okay, let's take a look. When we look at these, we want to note that these are the different types of muscles. Okay, if we continue our chart in the second column, we want to consider where are these muscles located. I think I'm, and then the third column is, you know, what control are they under? And then finally, what do they look like? What is their appearance? And we'll talk about that more in lab. Okay, so cardiac muscle occurs in the heart. Smooth muscle, hollow organs, blood vessels. Skeletal muscle, that's all the other muscles we think about as being muscles, right? Uh, your biceps, your triceps, etc. And what kind of control are each, are each of these muscles under? So the cardiac muscle is under something called involuntary control. And really when we talk about muscles, we want to say, okay, are they under voluntary control or involuntary control? Then we want to ask another question. Are they striated or are they not striated? Those are two questions we often ask. So let's start with the control question, voluntary or involuntary. So uh, cardiac muscle is involuntary. Smooth muscle is involuntary. You might say, what do we mean by involuntary? What we mean by that is your body is not consciously controlling that, or you are not consciously controlling that. You're not thinking that your cardiac muscle should beat, right? You're not thinking of that. 
you're not thinking that, uh, you know, the muscles in your blood vessels or your stomach should contract. You're not thinking about that. It just happens. So that's involuntary. Uh, and the little parentheses for each of those, medium and slow, is saying how fast does this happen. Now, on the other hand, some muscles are under voluntary contraction. So one example is the skeletal muscles, or other skeletal muscles. They're under, under voluntary contraction. In other words, you can choose to flex your muscle or not, and this contraction is very, very fast. Now, what do each of these muscles look like? Cardiac muscle is a sort of an appearance, right? Sort of a picture of cardiac muscle. And there's a few things you want to note. Uh, the cells are branched, right? So they're branched, they appear branched. And um, each um, muscle cell has one to two nuclei. And the general appearance of the muscle is striated. And you might say, well, what do we mean by striated appearance? Well, whenever we say striated, what we're really saying there is, if we look at the picture sort of right here, we're saying striations appear like lines like this. So when you see lines in the picture like that, that's what we're saying are striations. Okay, let's look at smooth muscle. Smooth muscle looks a little bit different here. So here, uh, these muscles have like a spindle or teardrop shape. So if you look at this picture right here, you'll see that, again, their shape is something like this, sort of like a teardrop or a spindle. That's what they look like. Also, you'll notice that they only have one nucleus, as opposed to one or two nuclei. You know, the smooth muscle only have one nucleus. The last category are skeletal muscles, and these have a few notes you want to make as well. So they appear very straight. Uh, the other two don't, so no straight, which means a straight line like this. They have many, many nuclei, and the nuclei are on the periphery of the cell. So you can see they're on the periphery there. And then finally, they have that striated appearance. Right? So again, if you look at it, they have these lines that are all lined up like that. So this is a very nice chart that would be uh, a great test question, right? So, or many questions. You know, what are the three types of muscle? Where are they located? What control are they under? And what appearance? Uh, it would be a great little chart to see if you can fill this in from memory. Okay, so now that we've talked about the types of muscles, let's go on to discuss muscular structure. So what's in each room? Okay, here's the objectives. These are the objectives that are associated with this. Again, you want to make sure that you can execute um, you know, these objectives and then make sure that you know these terms. Right? If there's anything that's unclear after this lecture, I encourage you to approach me during office hours or feel free to look up these terms in your book to make sure you can say what they are in about a sentence. Okay, so what's in each room? Let's continue that question. Okay, so if we look at the muscular structure, I'm saying from bicep to sarcomere. In other words, let's start with a bicep, right? Something that we look at like a bicep. Uh, and, you know, bicep would be right here, just so I don't confuse you on my picture. Right? So I'm changing the arrow here. <laughs> so if we look at the bicep, uh, let's talk about a few points here. So the first thing we want to note is that the skeletal muscle is an organ, right? A bunch of different tissues working together to have a common function in a given structure. So it's an organ. Uh, we'll notice that muscles are attached to bone via tendons, right? So they're attached via tendons. Uh, remember, that's a contrast to a ligament. So ligaments connecting bone to bone, right? Whereas um, tendons, those are uh, connecting bone to muscle. There's also something, a side note, something called an aponeurosis. And what this is, is these are sort of sheets of tendons that you'll see in your abdominal uh, region or in your back or in the back of your head, sort of in the small in the back of your head. There's many regions of the body you'll see those, and those are just like sheets of uh, tissues that resemble the tendons and the ligaments. Okay, so let's continue here. So let's focus from the outside of the muscle and then move in. So on the outside, we have a bunch of connective tissue that's called fascia. When we speak of fascia, I like to think of the fascia as coating the entire muscle. Now, if we work our way in from the fascia, the next layer of connective tissue that we see here is something called the epimyceum. And this is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. And uh, if we move in further, we'll see something called the perimyceum. All right, the perimyceum. If we go in further, we have the endomyceum. And the endomyceum is really composed of a lot of reticular fibers. Um, if we keep moving in here, we'll see something, if we extend this, you know, uh, this diagram all the way out, we something, see something here called a myocyte. This unit here, I just want to emphasize, this is something that if we say this is a skeletal muscle fiber or cell, this is what we're talking about. So myocytes are skeletal muscle cells, right? Uh, and then uh, if we look within them, we see a bunch of things called myofibrils, right? A bunch of things called myofibrils right down here. Okay, if we back up a second here, we'll see up here we see a uh, this big circular structure right here. We call this a fascicle. We call this a fascicle. And this is a bundle of cells put together. Okay, so that's what we're looking at there. 
And then a final thing I want to note here is that the, the muscles, um, oh, here we go, here's a bunch of uh, myo, uh, here's basically a bunch of myofibrils uh, connected one by one, uh, actually one myofibril, excuse me, um, extended. And this myofibril is composed of a bunch of things called sarcomeres. And we're going to emphasize these in the future slides in this lecture. But this is a sarcomere, right? And then here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. So again, the whole thing we're calling a myofibril, which is composed of a bunch of sarcomeres stacked one after the other after the other. And we're going to really zoom in on this later in this lecture. This is just um, showing you the entire structure of the muscle. Uh, so this is, um, you want to know these terms, but this is like a big picture uh, slide. Finally, you'll notice up here that uh, the muscle is innervated and there are blood vessels flowing through it. And so uh, this whole structure here is giving you an idea of sort of the gross anatomy of, of uh, muscles. Okay, so now that we talked about the gross anatomy, let's focus on a few different points I want to mention here. So one is, uh, what, is what are the different benefits of muscular structure? And one is that all this structure allows for independent movement, but coordinated, right? So you can move different muscles at the same time. Uh, you know, it allows for that type of movement. And then finally, it allows for the passage of blood vessels and nerves, which is something I mentioned a second ago. But that's very important. Uh, bloods rely, or blood, excuse me, muscles rely on a lot of blood, and you have to have nerves that can excite muscle contraction. Okay, so let's zoom in on that unit called the sarcomere. Uh, and that was that little part of the diagram at the bottom before that I had. Uh, again, this is a sarcomere here. It's composed of many different components. Uh, you'll see proteins uh, that are termed myosin. You'll see another group of proteins called actin. Uh, and then you're going to see another protein called titan here. And also what you're going to see is these proteins are sort of interlocked with each other, or overlapping maybe is a better word, almost as if you took your hands and you took your fingers and you interacted the fingers together, like folded your fingers together. And that's really what it's, it looks like. And almost, almost maybe like a zipper to a jacket. That's sort of what it looks like, too. There's a few things I want to note here. Uh, and by the end of this lecture, you'll see how this all comes together. But uh, the first protein is something called myosin up here. And the middle of the myosin, uh, there's something called the M-line. Right? Something called the M-line that we see right down the middle here. You'll also see that we have actin proteins. Um, and then you'll see that uh, on either end of the actin proteins, there's something called the Z-line. So you see that here. When we go from Z-line to Z-line, that is one sarcomere. Yeah, that's one sarcomere. Also, what I want to notice or note is that we have something called an H-zone here. And the H-zone is basically the space between the actin proteins. That's the H-zone. Uh, we also have something called the A-band. And the A-band is basically the length of the myosin. Okay, so the A-band is the length of the myosin. The myosin are the thicker filaments. The actin are the smaller filaments. Okay, so just to note that, how do I remember that? Myosin are the thicker filaments. I think of this phrase. I would like my grade, my is for myosin, right? To be a big fat A. In other words, my grade, right? Myosin is fat. Those are the thicker filaments. So that's sort of what I think of. What's another statement? How do we remember that uh, Z line to Z line is a sarcomere? I think of as a, if I'm saying it with like a maybe like a German accent, you know, just something silly to, to think of how to memorize this. So uh, this is Z sarcomere instead of the sarcomere, right? This is the Z sarcomere. And uh, that reminds me that Z line to Z line is a given sarcomere. So what happens basically, and you'll see an animation of this later on in this lecture, uh, basically what happens is the myosin has these little things called myosin heads right here, these little uh, projections sticking out. What's going to happen is those heads are going to link to actin, and they're going to pull actin towards the middle. So when you get muscular contraction, one of these regions will shorten. And the region that shortens is this region over here called the H-zone. That's what shortens. So I'm going to show you this in a second, right? But you have to know all the players and all the different proteins, what they are. Okay. And then at the bottom here, you have a real picture, right? So the top's cartoon, obviously. The bottom one's a real picture to show you what it looks like. Okay. So let's move on to muscular uh, contraction. We talked about the structure. Let's talk about contraction. Let's talk about these neuromuscular junctions. Specifically, we're talking about how do the appliances work. These are all the terms you want to know, as well as the learning objective. And let's talk about it now. So how do the appliances work? OK, so when we look at a neuromuscular junction, there's a few different terms we want to know so we can see the big picture. So on the very edge of this diagram, or the outer structure of this diagram, we have that sarcomama that we discussed earlier. 
If we go in from that, you'll see we have these different types of uh, structures that are called sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this really this is a type of endoplasmic reticulum. And what happens is this structure actually extends and interacts with something called T-tubules. These are transverse tubules, they're called. And basically, all these structures um, are permeating, I mean, it permeates the wrong word, but may extending through the muscle tissue, almost like a spider web. What's going to happen is they're eventually going to um, result in the release of calcium. And this release of calcium is what's going to help with muscular contraction. Uh, so I want to just point out these different structures here. And then uh, on the next slide, we're going to go into more details. So just, just showing you the big picture, you can see uh, you know, where these things are located. I encourage you to come back to the slide later after you've seen the next few slides. Okay, so let's continue to the neuromuscular junction here. And basically, we're going to discuss how something called an action potential causes the release of calcium, and this leads to a muscular contraction. I encourage you to think of this in different steps. Okay, so think of it in different steps. So, excuse me, here's step one. So step one is that something called an action potential is released. Uh, we're not going to go into the details of what an action potential is right now. Think of it as like an electrical charge uh, passing through a nerve or a neuron. Um, I encourage you to look at your book if you've never heard the term action potential before, just to look up a few line definition of it and maybe see a sentence or two about it, maybe a picture. Uh, but nevertheless, for now, let's just say an action potential occurs. And step two, what happens is this action potential causes the release of a molecule called acetylcholine, acetylcholine release. Uh, and so all these little red dots here, or squares, excuse me, uh, are, are supposed to represent acetylcholine. And this is the symbol for acetylcholine. Okay, so you have all of those inside something called the axon, right, which is basically the terminal end of a motor neuron. So the axon is this whole structure right here that I'm drawing right now. That's the axon. Okay, inside those little squares are acetylcholine. So you have that release, right, due to this action potential. But all this acetylcholine so far is inside the motor neuron at that terminal end. So the stuff you see right below that structure, ignore those red boxes for now. Um, so in the beginning, it's, it's inside that neuron still. So step three, what happens is, uh, actually, continuation of step two, I guess. Uh, calcium enters into the motor neuron, right? So it enters in. What's going to happen is calcium, indicated by those yellow circles, is going to form uh, a vesicle, or help form a vesicle around the acetylcholine, and it's going to allow the release of acetylcholine into the space outside the motor neuron. And so these are all the squares that are right here, right? Right in that gap right there. Uh, and that's something called that gap between um, the, um, the axon and the space below, basically this is the area we're referring to it as the motor end plate. That's what we're referring to it as, so the motor end plate. Okay, so what happens next? So step three is these acetylcholine molecules are interacting with receptors on the motor end plate, and they're called nicotinic receptors, nicotinic receptors. And what this does is this opens um, basically these things that are called voltage-gated um, channels. And these voltage-gated gated channels, which you see right over here, right, right over here, they're going to allow uh, sodium to enter into the cell and potassium to leave the cell. Uh, more sodium is coming into the cell than potassium is leaving, and this results in something called an action potential. And this action potential is demonstrated by all, I'll draw it on the side here, but all these things here where you have these positive charges, right, lined up against all these negative charges on the other side of the membrane, that's an action potential. So I would think of that as almost like an electrical current being passed through the cell. Okay, and so what happens is this action potential travels down, right, so we're going down here, travels down these things that are called transverse tubules. So it's traveling down those. Then what happens is that act of the action potential traveling down those transverse tubules, we call it number four, we call it depolarization. That's what we call it, depolarization. Eventually, what's going to happen is that depolarization is going to result in the release of calcium from something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which we discussed earlier. And that's step five, calcium release. So see all this calcium here being released, right, being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum through these things that are called DHP receptors, right? This calcium being released is the final thing I want you to think on in this slide, right? But this release of calcium leads to something happening next. Right? So it's like you want to know these five steps on the slide, 
and then we'll see what that thing next is, you know. But right now, just realize that release of calcium is the last step. Okay, one thing I want to note too is if you want to view an animation of what I just described on this slide, there's two great videos on YouTube. I'd click on this one first, right over here, then I'd click on this one second. Uh, these are both very, very good. Uh, and this describes the first part of the process I just described. This describes the second part. I encourage you to watch those two videos and then come back and watch this lecture again. Uh, it really helps to see the animation. Okay, so let's see what happens when you release uh, calcium. What happens next? Okay, and before we look at what happens next, how do you memorize, how do you possibly learn what was all on that last slide? That's a busy slide. There's a lot of stuff there. How do you learn that? I would think of this uh, phrase. Uh, it's a really nice day in Chicago, right? So a really nice day in Chicago. What does that mean? A really nice day in Chicago. Well, let's back up. And you can see here, A, right, helps you remember action potential. A really is release, right? You have to remember acetylcholine too, right? But acetylcholine release. A really nice day in Chicago, right? A really nice day in Chicago. Nice is nicotinic, day is depolarization, and Chicago is calcium release. So I encourage you to memorize that phrase to help you remember the previous slide all the events that happen at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, now that calcium is released, what happens next? Okay, so calcium is released, and this is what happens. The structure that you see here on the top, right over here, all these little beads, so all of these guys here, right, these little beads, uh, those are all actin proteins. What I want you to note is the actin proteins have these little holes that are in them, right, but these holes are covered up by a protein called tropomyosin. Those holes are the myosin binding sites. Right, where myosin wants to bind to actin. But if the holes are covered up by tropomyosin, myosin cannot bind to actin, right? If the holes are covered. Uh, so that's sort of where we are here. Now, why are they um, not open, right? Why is tropomyosin blocking those, those holes? Well, it's blocking those holes just because of the way tropomyosin interacts with another protein called troponin, which is over here. Uh, so the way they interact, that's basically what's happening. Okay. So Top situation is myosin binding sites are blocked, right? Okay, what happens if calcium is released? And that's where we ended the previous slide, if you recall, right? So calcium is released, what's happening? Well, what calcium is gonna do, and calcium is indicated here by these little blue spheres, right? Calcium is gonna interact with troponin. You see that right here. And when it interacts with troponin, it's gonna cause a shift, right? Sort of a change. And troponin is going to pull tropomyosin, which tropomyosin are these long cords of proteins, right? Troponin is going to pull tropomyosin off, off of those openings on the actin. And it's going to expose those, those myosin binding sites, right? Where myosin wants to bind to actin. And so what that's going to do is that's going to allow for binding and it's going to allow for muscular contraction. Okay, so now let's go on to the sarcomere and see how this all gets put together. Okay, so this is how it all gets put together. And uh, what I'm going to do is sort of start at the top and work our way around, right? So when we start this uh, situation here, and this is showing you muscular contraction, it's something called uh, sliding filaments, right? the sliding filament model. So what happens in step one here is myosin cross bridges are attached to actin, right? And you see that right here. You see the myosin head, which is this right here, it is interacting to uh, actin right, via those myosin binding sites. So it's a cyclic process, but let's just start there. So that's our starting point. Okay, so what happens next? What happens next, you see it right here. So something called ADP, which is uh, adenosine diphosphate, and inorganic phosphate are released from the structure. They're released. Now, we're obviously not covering every single tiny detail. I said, well, why are they released? We're going to ignore that for now. I just want to point out the main steps. So they're released, and when they're released, what that does is that causes something called a working stroke uh, or a power stroke. And what that is is this is where the myosin physically moves. And you see that right here. So that's where you're getting muscular contraction. Okay. Then what happens is um, you'll have step three happen here, right? Uh, so what happens is as a new ATP attaches to the myosin head, right, the cross bridge detaches. So you need this ATP to come in here to attach to this myosin head to release the head. That's what step three is, is the releasing of the head. Okay, step four. Step four, the ATP is split, right, into uh, adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. And what this does, it does something called cocking the head, right? And the head's gonna cock and the head's going to 
reattach, right? And you return to step one. So that's sort of the whole procedure there. Uh, on the bottom left here, you'll see I have a very nice video that completes those previous two videos. This is the third in a series of three videos. Uh, it's a nice YouTube video that shows you this whole process. So I encourage you to you know, maybe even pause the video now and watch that if you want, or at least watch it afterwards. There's another video here showing you the whole process as well. It's good to see it a few different ways. Okay, so there's a few different notes here I want to talk about, and then we'll talk about some disorders and muscles, and then we're going to bring the lecture home here. So uh, there's a time relation between when you have this, um, basically this action potential, and you get contraction. So what I want to show you here is on this x-axis on this graph, we have time. Okay, so that's what's on the x. And everything else is just showing you basically when things happen that we just discussed to show you a time frame here. So the first uh, sort of uh, curve here is uh, showing you an action potential, right? And it's showing you um, the action potential that occurs uh, right at that uh, motor end plate, right? Uh, or I should say at the axon. Uh, it is going to lead to that release of acetylcholine to the motor end plate. The next thing that happens is you have calcium levels in the cytoplasm rising, right? And there's a little latent period here, so there's a delay. There's a subtle delay, you'll notice, between the action potential and the calcium levels rising. Okay, and that's sort of indicated right there, right, our calcium curve. The final thing is, is after we get that calcium release, right, then all the events that I just described on the previous slide will happen, and we get our muscular contraction. And that's what this third curve is showing you. Again, just showing you sort of the time delay you see. Uh, between the action potential, then the calcium change, then the muscle contraction. So uh, if I were to label them, you know, here's action potential, right? Calcium change, and then muscular contraction. Okay, so let's go into the final thing here. Uh, now that we talked about the types of muscles, the structure, the contraction, how it works. I want to talk about a few different skeletal muscle issues that can happen. So in other words, problems that can occur. Uh, if you like my analogy, right, we toured, toured the rooms already. We looked in a given room. We looked in the kitchen. We looked at how the appliances work. Now we want to say what problems could occur with our appliances. Okay, so these are the learning objectives associated with this lecture. These are some terms that you want to make sure you know. Uh, if you don't hear it in the video or if it doesn't make sense exactly, make sure you look up these terms in your book, right, to make sure that you understand what they are. Okay, so what problems can occur? Well, the first one is something called rigor mortis. Not that it's a problem per se, right? But, you know, something we want to discuss. So what this is, is this is stiffening of muscles that results after someone has died. Uh, you may have seen pictures of this where uh, someone has been dead for a little while, or it could be a person, it could be an animal, uh, and they're very, very stiff, right? It's very hard to move their muscles. It happens about, you know, 2 to 12 hours after death. You might say, why? Well, this is sort of why. So as someone dies, their nutrients and their oxygen is depleted, right? And their ATP is depleted. If they're not producing ATP, what cannot happen? The myosin heads cannot release from the actin. If you look at that cyclic chart we had a little bit ago, those four steps. If the myosin heads cannot release from the actin, the muscles cannot change uh, their length at all, right? They're stuck in whatever position the person died in. And so that's what that next bullet point is saying. Okay, now eventually, you know, this rigor mortis will disappear. Now, it, it depends on the temperature, it depends on environmental conditions, you know, so these are just general times I'm giving you, but, you know, about, you know, after, you know, two days or so, you start to get this rigor mortis disappearing, and the reason is because the muscles at that stage are physically degrading, right, so that's why you get this disappearing. But it's a very interesting uh, uh, question, you know, or fact, It'd be a great test question to associate this with the attachment of myosin heads to actin. Okay, there's a couple other, uh, you know, types of, uh, you know, abnormalities we want to discuss. So there's muscular uh, dystrophy, uh, something else called myasthenia gravis. And uh, whenever you look at any type of uh, disorder, whether it's with muscles or, or anything we discuss in this course, I encourage you to go to the foundations that are, uh, you know, these wonderful foundations that are established to raise money and, you know, to help provide more research for these different types of conditions. Uh, they're a great place to go to uh, not only, obviously, donate if you wanted to, uh, but also to learn more about these disorders because they introduce it at a very basic level uh, as a jumping point if someone hadn't heard of these before. So the, the foundation websites are great uh, learning tools. Okay, so let's talk about muscular dystrophy. So it's X-linked recessive uh, genetic condition, right? It happens about 1 in 4,000 boys, uh, though it can happen in women too. Uh, and basically what happens is there's this uh, dystrophin protein that is sort of abnormal at the inner surface of a plasma membrane. 
and it leads to muscular uh, deterioration. Myasthenia gravis uh, is basically, uh, there is no known genetic cause, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, what this happens is an individual has very low levels of uh, acetylcholine receptors, right, at the motor end plate. So this would be a great example right here to relate this to the diagrams I showed you before. So before you proceed, even think what would happen if they're getting these action potentials but they, and they're releasing acetylcholine, but they don't have receptors, right, they don't have receptors uh, at that motor end plate, what would happen to their muscular contractions? So think of that. Okay, and we see what can happen is basically there is a decreased magnitude of this potential. So the action potential happens, right? But um, basically at the motor end plate, that, that action potential is not realized, right? It starts stop, stops at that point. So if it stops at that point, what happens is you're not getting the muscular contractions happening as easily as they normally would. So you get increased muscular fatigue as the day goes on. So uh, there's different degrees to this disorder, but um, you know at the beginning of the day maybe the person can smile, um, you know, to a certain degree, right? Uh, but by the end of the day, their muscles get so tired because of these low levels of acetylcholine receptors that if the person is trying to smile, they uh, really might have a hard time smiling. Uh, it also causes some issues with walking and that type of thing. So intelligence is not infected, uh, not, not 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 affected. Excuse me, not affected at all. I had a student before that had this condition, and uh, you know she was a very bright student. Uh, but you could tell when she would smile, it looked like these pictures, right? In other words, you see this is someone trying to, this person and this person are both trying to give, you know, very full smiles. But this is sort of as much as they're able to smile uh, because of that fatigue uh, that they get in their muscles. So um, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, condition. Okay, so those are the four things that we talked about today. You want to make sure you know the objectives for each of these. Uh, make sure you know the terms, right? If you have any questions, please come to office hours. And if you're not sure of the terms, please look them up in your book as well. Um, one thing I want to note here is, again, this would be a great chart to practice on, right? So go ahead and print this off the PowerPoint file, and this will be a wonderful slide for you to fill in, see if you can fill in these gaps. And the same for this one, too. Could you fill in these five different steps, right? And, you know, different texts might label them slightly differently. Sometimes I see seven steps, sometimes six. I've broken it up into five steps, but could you label that diagram? Okay, and that's today's lecture.